Welcome back Retro Gang. Today we'll go in depth on everything within the Becoming Samurai music trailer shown during Night City Wire Episode 2. The trailer has a lot less material than the other two trailers but there's a few pretty cool and interesting things within. I'm also happy to announce I'll be doing a giveaway so make sure to stick around till the end of the video for the details. Alright you ready? Strap in boys. Let's ride. In the opening scene, we're greeted with the views off of the balcony of an extremely affluent villa overlooking some skyscrapers. We later found out that this villa is owned by Johnny Silverhand. This is almost definitely within the North Oak sub-district of Westbrook, looking towards Japantown. As we know, ads are very prevalent in Night City, and there's many here that we've seen before. Within the villa is a 360 degree holographic television that's usually seen in many middle class to wealthy households. Moving into the house, we find the remnants of a party. There's half empty beer, empty wine glasses, and women's garments everywhere. The next scene is a lower view of the same table, with more furniture and bottles thrown about. I'm really intrigued by this solid gold flamingo. They are obviously beautiful creatures and in Night City, they seem to signify luxury and wealth, seen in prominent locations on hotels and buildings. As the scene continues, a Spotify logo pops up in the bottom corner, and I got super excited thinking we'd have all our songs in the game, but I'm obviously an idiot so let's just move on. At 16 seconds in, it looks like the party moved over to the piano, with more women's garments and empty drinks as well as pillows and sheets on the floor. In direct contrast to the affluence of this entire home, the next scene shows the walls of Johnny's hangout scarred with graffiti. Most of it is unlegible, even the ones you can read are just random or expletive expressions. Next we get an amazingly detailed shot of Johnny's cybernetic arm. Initially I thought the pike on his elbow was a weapon in this scene, but after looking over every piece of promotional material, he's had it since his iconic unveiling, albeit hidden behind his body or poorly lit in most situations. In the background are two of Samurai's biggest records. This is the first we've seen chipping in with this album cover. It may be its original artwork because we find out later that this is actually a flashback to sometime in the early 2000s. We know that Johnny is a major part of the entire cyberpunk universe so it would be amazing to relive some more of his defining moments. Maybe even a flashback to the Arasaka Tower assault during the fourth corporate war? That would be amazing. The next scene is more close-ups of Johnny's cyberware. You can see all the detail in the cables and cords, and of course Johnny's arm was developed by Arasaka. The characteristics in his shirt stand out as well. Little specks of dust and stitching are clearly visible. We can also see Johnny's dog tags, which are from his time in the Marine Corps. We don't know too much about his story before Samurai, but maybe we'll get more of these flashbacks that explore the lore from his corporate rebellion to his rise to stardom. We move to Johnny's back where we can see what he's been viewing, a collection of Samurai's records on this gigantic flat screen. Never Fade Away and Chippin' In are obviously the most notable. The records on the right are Blistering Love, another chart-topping single, as well as Carrie Uridine's second conflict, a chronicle to the tragedies and heroes of the Second Central American War in which the US invaded Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Venezuela from 2003 to 2010. Seeing that these records are lumped with already released music and the fact that both the Ballad of Buck Ravers and the Like Supreme were released during Night City Wire, I can speculate that we may get the release of Blistering Love during or right after Night City Wire Episode 3. At 30 seconds in, we have Johnny Silverhand in all his glory. We know that he's in the same room from the graffiti in the background. He has a large collection of guitars hung up as well. Then a really cool close-up showing even more detail in his skin, hair, and beard. In the next few scenes, we move into a samurai concert. Front and center is Kerry Uridine. We'll have a much better shot of him in a bit. I'd also imagine Johnny is right off camera to his left. Easily missed is this pair of legs that belongs to Nancy, Samurai's keyboardist. After the band split up, she later became a major news presence at Network News 54. And the venue they're playing is called The Hammer. After some in real life scenes, we emerge at 1 minute and 22 seconds in with our first good look at the larger than life Filipino descent rock star, Kerry Uridine. He's obviously a lot shorter than Johnny, standing at what looks to be between 5 foot 5 to 5 foot 7 inches tall. He's rocking an iconic 80s style mullet, skinny, washed and ripped jeans with classic high top converse. His samurai jacket is also a lot different than any we've seen before. Obviously being custom, it's very short and has a crop top vibe. Most 80s rock stars were quite famous for the flamboyancy in their style. I think CDPR captures this really well. Moving back to the start of this scene, we can see some more polish is needed here. In the next scene, Johnny tosses his really battered guitar on a dressing room counter. Clearly stressed or anxious, he reaches for a bottle of pills that he discovers is empty. As he looks in the mirror, we can see he's still in the same venue, with the words on the back wall reading The Hammer. Johnny also has some company with him, maybe an adoring groupie or fan. Again, rock stars of the 80s had no shortage of female attention. We know this is not Nancy as she's seen wearing thigh high shorts as well as having a short dark colored hairstyle later on in the trailer. At 1 minute 34 seconds in is probably the most confusing 
interesting part of this entire trailer for me. We are clearly viewing from Johnny's perspective as he points an unknown pistol toward the crowd. The gun may be his custom made Malorian Arms 3516, but we've yet to see that weapon rendered in 2077 so it's unclear. I'm confident we'll get to play this portion in the game so I'm intrigued to see why Johnny is so anxious and concerned in these few scenes. A few more in real life scenes play again then we come to some samurai posters on these walls. The graffiti is unlegible. The scene continues into a close up of Johnny during another samurai performance. It's hard not to notice the cool art on Johnny's right arm. There's some Japanese kanji so if you can read Japanese let us all know what it means in the comments below. Above that are the letters G M N. In another shot you can see there's more beside it that we just can't read. Above that is a snake in the form of an infinity loop which CDPR may have placed there as a nod to the whole immortality aspect of Johnny and the relic chip. After even more in real life scenes, we come back at 4 minutes in to our final in-game scene in the same venue as before. We get a panoramic of the entire samurai band, Johnny at front stage, to his left is their bassist Henry, as well as Nancy in the back, then drummer Denny, and finally Carrie. Even though we've never seen this venue they're playing, I just couldn't shake its familiarity. It's obviously not the hammer, the venue from before. So where is this? The green and yellow hue of the fluorescent lighting, the endless amounts of graffiti on the wall, the blue LEDs, and even the pipes along the ceiling. The general atmosphere is exactly like only one other place we've seen, the afterlife. We know that this was Johnny's main haunt. He famously has a drink named after him. The afterlife has underground levels for top fixtures and patrons alike, so it's not too far-fetched to imagine Johnny Silverhand and Samurai having a concert at the most notorious club in Night City. Thanks so much for making it to the end. I've been planning for a while to do a 100 subscriber giveaway, but I had no idea I'd have to do one so soon. In the last few days, I've seen way more growth than I could have ever imagined, and I have to thank Reddit user Puipi Muggins for sharing my video to all you amazing people. My plan was to give away a copy of Cyberpunk 2077 for my 100 subs, but now we're on track to almost 200 subscribers. So if you win, not only will you get the game, but also the digital version of the Cyberpunk 2077 lore book. Now I know most of us are fanatics, and you may already have the book and the game pre-ordered. So in that case, I'll just send you the cash. We're all strapped for it in these times, so I know you'll definitely put it to good use. To enter the giveaway, all you have to do is go over to Twitter and retweet my tweet announcing the giveaway. Then follow me and you're good. That way I'll be able to DM you if you win. Now there's not a lot of us here, so your chances of winning is exponentially higher. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed, don't forget to leave a like for the Y tag and consider subscribing for more Cyberpunk 2077 content.